right, children, let's take our Bibles and go to the book of John, chapter number four. John, chapter four. Now, after the, I don't think I mentioned it on the announcements, but after the morning service, Brother Ray Law is going to meet with us just a few minutes to tell us what we need to bring on that fishing trip, okay? It's going to be about a six-hour fishing trip. Yes, sir? No, no choir practice today. No choir practice today. But those of you that are going on the fishing trip, just after the service, meet just for a few minutes before you take off, okay? All right, John chapter number four. John chapter number four, our example, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's begin reading here in verse number 28. The Bible said, then the woman, or the woman left, let me back up, the woman then, I got the these and the thens in there, didn't I? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith unto the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, There are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice, rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor, other men labored, and ye entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with him, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now we learn a lot by watching the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ is our example. Uh, I remember, uh, you, of course, as you were working, as your apprentice, some of you had to serve in apprenticeships, you had to learn. You had to watch what was going on. I remember when I got out of the Navy, I was watching. I was uh, learning some things. I became an electrician uh, after working for a company out of Knoxville, Tennessee, and we were wiring a Sears and Roebuck. I remember when I very first started, I would get shocked all the time, all the time. And those fellas, if you've ever been in a construction crew, they like to play jokes on you. They do. If you've, uh, we were building a big uh, shopping, a big mall, big two-story mall. And I was in uh, wiring the Sears and Roebuck building, and, and those carpenters would come over, those union carpenters would come over and wait till I begin to, I'd hook them up some power. They'd say, electrician, where's our power? And um, I would go and I would hook them up some temporary power, and while I was hooking it up, they'd always go to the breaker and flip it on, and just to watch me jump off that ladder. They would do that. So I began to watch. I began to learn some things. I began to learn how to handle the electricity while it was on. I began to watch the carpenters as they went back, and I learned some things. I learned what to do and what not to do. It's like launching aircraft on a carrier. I learned what kind of tension bar to put in those planes before we put them on the catapult. If we put the wrong tension bar, the bar would break. The plane would go off too soon or too late. And so you had to do everything right. Well, when I watched the Lord Jesus Christ, I learned some things. I'm taught some things and some things that we need to apply to our lives. Well, in our text... The Samaritan woman watched the Lord Jesus Christ and she was changed. She was changed from a harlot to a soul winner. And she changed. Her vocation changed. Her home changed. And her attitude changed. If you'll notice back in John chapter number 4 and verse number 9, when the Lord came unto her, uh, then saith the woman of uh, Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew... Askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now, she was involved in the class war. She thought because she was a Samaritan that automatically the Jews hated her. And by the way, most did. Most did. But here is a different man. Here is the God man. 
In verse number nine, we look at this woman very defiant. She called Jesus a traveling Jew. And then if you'll notice in verse number 11 and 12, still on the defense, this woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep from whence thou hast that living water. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And of course, we see the question mark there. She was very defiant in verse number nine, still on the defense, yet possibly, just possibly, he might be just a little greater than Jacob. Well, we get to verse number 19, and the Bible said, now we look at her attitude changing. Her attitude changing. Start out very defiant. She became less defiant, still on the defense in verse number 11 and 12. But when we get to verse number 19, she said, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Just might be a prophet I'm speaking to. So you see how her attitude is changing as she watched and listened to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, we get to verse number 29. What did she say? She said, come see, come see a man. The Bible says in verse 29, which told me all things ever I did, is not this the Christ. So we see how her attitude changed. Now we find out according to verse number four of John chapter number four, how the Lord chose her. The Bible said he must needs go through Samaria. As a triangle has three sides, so must the Lord Jesus Christ go to Samaria. Why? He was going to do a little soul winning. Did you know that a long, long time ago, before you were ever born, actually before the foundation of the world, but came to fruition on the cross of Calvary, that God chose the whole world to believe him? Did you know that God chose you? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, that puts a hole in Calvinism. Calvinist, Calvinistic teaching and doctrine says God chose this crowd over here to go to heaven and this crowd over here to go to hell. God did no such thing. God chose the world. Salvation is a whosoever will gospel. It's a whosoever will that comes to the Lord Jesus Christ may be saved. So we see how the Lord changed, uh, chose her there in verse number four. We see how the Lord changed her. We see how the Lord challenged her in the, as we look at the interview with the Lord Jesus Christ and this woman at the well and how he changed her. Is not this the Christ? Well, we learn some things about the Lord Jesus Christ. We learn his attitude. Did you know the Lord Jesus Christ had an unselfish attitude? He wanted to get people saved, and then after he got them saved, he wanted to get them service, serving. He pulled us out of the miry clay. He picked me up. He picked you up to save you, to recycle you, and then to use you. That's what God wants to do. And if you'll notice there in verse number 35, 36, how the Lord in John chapter number four began to use this woman whom he just got through saving there earlier in John chapter number four. Thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? We look at his interview. God does not uh, come bashing uh, people over the head with his word. He sat down and simply talked to them. He dealt with Nicodemus in John chapter number three in a different manner, although he gave the same word. Nicodemus, your problem is you need to be born again. And he began to search out the Old Testament scripture and begin to give them to Nicodemus knowing that Nicodemus was a lawyer. He was a man of the law. He understood the Old Testament, how that God took that interview and transformed Nicodemus. Well, we look here in John chapter number four, how he's taken this interview and changing and transforming this woman that he met of Samaria at Jacob's well to use her. And indeed, he did use her. Well, let's look at the Lord Jesus' attitude, and it should help us as we go out and witness to others. Now, I would say that there's probably some sitting in the congregation this morning that have never witnessed about the Lord Jesus Christ. Never has told anybody about Christ. Well, maybe you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. You have an opportunity this morning to accept him as your Savior. And when we accept the Lord Jesus as our Savior, God requires of us just to tell what we know. He didn't say we had to go back and expound all the way from Genesis to Revelation. Just tell what you know. If you're really born again, you know how that happened. 
You know what Christ has done for you and we begin to share Christ. And we should all share Christ, amen? But let's look at the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ that will help us as we go out daily telling other people about Christ, amen, and what he's done for us. First of all, the Lord Jesus Christ had an attitude of confidence. Confidence. Let's be confident. I am very confident that what God says he means, amen? We can be that confident. We don't have to go off and try to make up and manufacture stories. When we're witnesses, we, when we're witnessing to someone, we can open the Bible and say, thus saith the Lord. This is what God says. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what the Bible says. And uh, we have that confidence when we begin to talk about the Word of God that God is going to use His Word and we have a promise in the book of Isaiah that it will not return void but accomplish what He sets it out to do. Amen? So let's keep preaching the Word. We see the attitude of confidence. Look at verse number 34. The Bible says, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish his work. What a confident attitude. Did Jesus ever have any doubt that he would finish the work that God gave him to do? Not one time, not one minute, not one second. Jesus always knew the will of the Father. He had an attitude of, the conf uh, of confidence. His attitude was to finish the work that God gave him to do, according to verse number 34. Now, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10, and verse number 7, and also verse number 9, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. That's why Jesus came, to do the will of God. What was the will of God? To die for the sins of the whole world. The Bible says in Luke chapter number 9, and verse number 51, Steadfastly, the Lord Jesus, steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Do you think that the Lord knew what was going to befall him there? I guarantee he did. But he set his face to go to Jerusalem. The Bible tells me in the book of Luke, chapter number 23, I believe it is, in verse number 28, uh, verse number 28, uh, that uh, uh, as, the, as he was carrying his cross uh, up Gabbath, or carrying it toward Calvary, that there was a group of women that was crying and you remember what the Lord said to them as he was carrying his cross as he looked at the women he said don't weep for me he said weep for yourselves and your children why because his face was toward Calvary that's where he was going to accomplish the very will of God and the very will of God for Christ Jesus was to die for the sins of the whole world, to be that propitiatory sacrifice that would satisfy the just demands of a holy God. We can stop right now and say, thank God, amen, amen for what he's done for us on Calvary, amen. Jesus' attitude of confidence. Now, basically, and I've said this before, if you'll go through the book of John, the gospel of John was written for a purpose to bring men and women to a saving knowledge of himself. Basically, in every sermon that Jesus preached in the book of John, he included three things. He said, first of all, heaven's my home. He said, I came down from the Father. He said, if you believe in God, believe also in me. He tells us in John chapter number one that the word became flesh. He always claimed equality with the Father. Heaven's my home, God's my Father, and I can give you eternal life. Amen? I can give you eternal life. If you'll come to the Lord Jesus Christ believing Him, He will impute to you something that is necessary, something that you have to have to get in the very presence of a holy God, and that's the righteousness of Himself. That is the righteousness of Christ. Amen? And so He'll impute that to me and to my account as a result of the work of Christ, I can go to heaven. Amen? So heaven's my home, God's my Father, and I can give you everlasting life. You know what the people's reply was to all of these sermons, basically? Every last sermon Jesus preached. At the end of every, every gospel, the gospel writer gives an account of the crucifixion. And all of the good that Jesus had done, raising the dead, healing the sick, being a friend, comforting and helping and, and, and working, they cried, crucify him. He speaks blasphemy. You stand at the foot of the cross, you'll find out what the world's like. Cruel and cracked and corrupt, ungodly, 
hearts that are sinful and desperately wicked. You'll find that man, because of his, his, his very nature, is, a, is nothing in the world but a dirty, rotten, guilty sinner. Based upon what the Word of God says. You'll find out what the world's like if you'll stand at the foot of the cross. But my dear friend, you're going to find out who, what he's like as well. Amen. You see what you're like, but then you'll see what he's like as he hung between heaven and earth and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Thank God for a wonderful, wonderful Savior. Amen. Finally, he cried on the cross of Calvary. It is finished. What's finished? The work of redemption is absolutely finished. Finished. There's nothing that you and I could add to Christ's work of redemption. It's finished. So we see the attitude of Jesus, an attitude of confidence. My, my, he was so confident. I hope we're getting to know him just a little bit better this morning. And then not only an attitude of confidence, but the woman found out that he had an attitude of caring about people. Did you know that, that it seems like, it seems like the hardest thing, even for Christians, is, is to love one another. To, to love one another. The Bible tells me in the book of John, chapter number 13, verse number 34 and 35, it ends up by saying, by this, people will know you. How? It's by our love one toward another. Did you know I read that verse and the Lord gave me something out of that, a little statement out of that. Um, if the world is going to know the church by our love one toward another, then God is giving the world permission to judge the church. Now, I wonder, wonder what people on the outside here in Milton, Florida, wonder what they say about Faith Baptist Church. I just wonder. It's just something for you to think about. I wonder what they say. Do you really love people like you're supposed to love people? Well, I learned in John chapter number four, just by the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ, I learned that he had an attitude of confidence, but I also learned he had an attitude of caring. You, how in the world can I care about people like that? Well, you're going to have to die. I didn't mean physically. The Bible says in John chapter number 12, verse number 24, if a corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, what does it do? Bringeth forth fruit. The Bible says in Galatians chapter number 2 and verse number 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And this life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So let me tell you something, just die to self. Christian, die to self. You learn to love like he loved. The dead man doesn't get his feelings hurt. <laughs> just don't do it. You go to, and I'm not telling you, don't do this. But if you was to go to a coffin in a funeral home and a dead man, you can sit there and call him every name you want to call him. You can poke at him. You can make fun of him, make fun of his dog and everything else. He won't say a word. Did you know that when a Christian gets a hold of this dying to self, you can't hurt his feelings? You really can't. You'll learn how to love people. Although, look what they did to the Lord Jesus Christ. Crucified him, called him a blasphemer, called him illegitimate, called him everything in the world you could think that they could call a man, they called Jesus. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them, Amen. for they know not what they yes, do. Sir. But preacher, they didn't do to you what they did to me. They didn't do to you what they did to Christ. Amen. And he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Thank God for the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus loved his disciples. Having loved his own, John chapter number 13, verse number one, having loved his own while we were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And then in John chapter number 11, how he loved his friends, the Bible said, behold, how he loved him, speaking of Lazarus. And then John three sixteen that we've already quoted two or three times today, God so loved the world, the world. You see, the church's number one problem is not wisdom and understanding, I don't believe. I don't believe that's the problem here. You know what I believe it is? It's a need of Holy, uh, Holy Ghost baptism of love is what it is. I'm talking about loving people like we ought to. Doesn't the Bible say in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 13, verse number 13, now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is what? Charity, love. The greatest is love. Now, that's what the Bible says. So we need to love people. I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot by watching Christ 
In John chapter number four, he had such an attitude of confidence. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. I, he, I'm learning that he cares about people. He cared about a Samaritan and not just a Samaritan woman, but a, a Samaritan woman of ill repute. How he cared about people, how he loved people. If our love would be just half of what Christ had, we'd see more people in the church today. Let them know about Christ. He had an attitude of confidence. He had an attitude of caring. He had an attitude of compassion. I sure hope we're getting to know him just a little bit better today. Compassion. Com what is compassion? Somebody said, willing to suffer with. Willing to suffer with. In other words, just sit down and cry with someone. Just suffer. sit down with them. Exhort exhortation. Just sit down with them. Compassion, willing to suffer with. As a sheep without a shepherd, we are. So the Lord Jesus Christ came and he came and sat down with us. Amen. He came to the lame, the halt, the blind, the leper. In Mark chapter number 10, he came to the blind man Bartimaeus. No one wanted anything to do with Bartimaeus. And he cried, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. They were trying to shut him up, tell him to be quiet. And the more they told him to be quiet, the louder he got and said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and listened to Bartimaeus. He said to the leper in Luke chapter number five, the leper said to the Lord Jesus Christ, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. I know you can. If thou wilt, thou can make me clean. He came to the line. He came to the demoniac in Mark chapter number five in verse number eight and nine. And the Lord Jesus said, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. What is thy name? It's a legion for we are many. I am so proud and so glad today to tell you that the same one that cast out the devils and healed the sick and healed the lepers and raised the dead is in our midst today. Amen. The same one. Praise God for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came to the down and outers. He came to the one with an issue of blood. In, in uh, Luke chapter number eight, he came to Jairus that lost his daughter. He came to those that were defiled uh, with leprosy. Ceremonially, he came. In Luke chapter number seven, we see the woman with the alabaster box in verse number 44, 45, 46, and 47. How the Lord dealt with her. How that she was so grateful that her sins had been forgiven, that she came and anointed the feet of Jesus with her tears and wiped them with her, with her hair is what the Bible said. Uh, uh, just a display of love to the Savior. What an attitude the Lord Jesus had, that of compassion. Compassion. Thank God for Christ. He came to the effeminate, the whoremonger, the drunkard, the liar, the fornicator, I have named off some people right here that you probably wouldn't even want to be around. But Bible, the Bible says, such were some of you, yes, but you. now you're clean. Amen. You're clean. All because of the blood of Christ. You know where the Lord Jesus would be today if he was here? I guarantee you'd find him in nursing homes. You'd find him down here on Leprosy Street. You'd find him going house to house. You'd find him healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, and working and telling and preaching the gospel of salvation. Amen? Thank God for Jesus Christ. What an attitude he had. What an attitude. That of, uh, of confidence. He had an attitude of compassion. He had an attitude of caring. And then I know that I've brought this up in times past before, but we made up a word for this one. The Lord Jesus, based upon John chapter number four, I'm finding another attitude that I find that Jesus had, and that is of could beism. Could beism. You can write it down. It's good. The Lord Jesus always saw what you could be. He saw the Samaritan woman as a soul winner. Look at verse number 35 of John chapter number four. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. You see in verse number 35, and look at verse number 39, many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the who? Of the woman. In verse number 35, 36, 37, 38, and 39, you're seeing the woman going into Sychar, and here... 
She's leading some people, men and women, coming toward the Lord Jesus Christ on the path through the fields. And Jesus said, look here. <laughs> Lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. From a harlot to a soul winner. Somebody asked me the question one time. They said, Brother Rowan said, wonder why the disciples didn't bring any back. Good question. They went into Sychar, but you have a woman that couldn't get over her salvation. And she went into Sychar and said, come see a man that told me all things ever I've done. It's not this is a Christ. Now, well, he changed her. That's could, well, saw what they could be. From a harlot to a soul winner. He saw John from a son of thunder to a beloved disciple. He saw Saul of Tarsus to the apostle Paul to the Gentiles. In my lifetime, I read a story about a fellow named Mel Trotter. How many here have ever heard of Mel Trotter? Few of you. Mel Trotter. Mel Trotter's an evangelist. Was a great evangelist. Preached all over this country. Mel Trotter gave his testimony one time. I heard it on the radio on Pacific Garden Mission. I said, man, I, there's no way God could use a fellow like that. I was thinking in my own mind. You know, Mel Trotter was a drunk. He was, I mean, just a drunk. Spent all of his money. Mistreated his wife. Mistreated his child. He had no money to buy milk for the baby. He just drank it all up. He drank it all up. His... Um, Baby, he had left. His wife had had to go to work and support him. Isn't that, isn't that sad how that has to happen sometimes? By, by default, a woman has to take the position of a man. A man's too sorry. Right. Nevertheless, she was working. She was working. He was supposed to watch the kids. He, was, he left. He, he, the only thing that went through his mind was that drink, that extra, that other drink. I want another drink. He left his kid there in the house, and he went down to the bar, got him a drink. While he was gone, the house caught on fire. The baby was burned, killed the baby. His own testimony, he said, I was so low that at the funeral home, I went to the coffin. He couldn't even afford clothes to put on his baby. He went to the coffin, and he got the shoes off his little dead baby's feet. And took him and set him on the bar and said, I want a drink. Traded his dead baby's shoes for a drink. Now, you and I would say that there's no way that God could ever use a man like that. You know what he did? He was the effeminate, the whoremonger, the drunkard, the reviler. Such were some of ye, but now you're washed. Amen. Let me tell you something, folks. I don't know what background you have. Don't need to know. But I do know this for sure. That whatever background you have, the Lord Jesus Christ cares about you, loves you, and died for you, and will pick you up and recycle you and use you for His glory. God used Mel Trotter. God saved Mel Trotter. Converted at the Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago, Illinois and became uh, one of the greatest evangelists, one of the greatest preachers, leading people to Christ. He was so, so overjoyed with his salvation, he never could get over it. Never could get over his salvation, that he served the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord uh, sees your attitude of what you could be, what you could be. And then in closing, there's another, there's another attitude I see that comes out of John chapter number four of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's an attitude of commitment. You see, the Lord Jesus never gave up. He never gave up. We go back through Scripture how He never gave up on the woman. He never gave up on Nicodemus. He never, he never gave up on Peter. And look how much trouble Peter caused him. Peter was always sticking his foot in his mouth and causing trouble for the Lord. Uh, James and John, they did things that caused trouble and caused hardship for the Lord when they asked for positions in the kingdom. Can I sit on your right hand, another one on your left hand, and, and, and just, just cause problems for the Lord? But the Lord never gave up. And the Lord's never going to give up on you. To your last breath, my dear friend, if you're here and you're struggling with your salvation, the Lord will never give up on you. Amen? Don't you give up on Him. There was, um, there was a story um, that I tell, and I'm, I'm sure I've told it here, but I, I need to tell it again, about commitment. It was my very first church. I just graduated Tennessee Temple University in 1985. 
And I took my first church in just north in a little town north of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I began to go out up and down the streets visiting, knocking on doors and passing out tracts and inviting people to church. And I went to one fellow's house. His name was Raymond. We called him Mr. Raymond. Mr. Raymond, I want to invite you to come to the church and I'm the new pastor and so on. He said, well, I might be there one day. And I, but he was such a pleasant fellow. He was then, I was uh, in my 20s. He was, uh, he was in his 80s. And, and I just loved sitting there and talking with him. I loved to hear the old stories that he had and things like that. And so I made it a habit to frequently visit with him. And so I knocked on his door again and he invited me in. We sit down. His wife fixed us a cup of coffee and I began to talk and I said, we're still looking for you at church. We still want your family in church. I'm coming. Well, sure enough, he did come, but tears started running down his face. And I said, Mr. Raymond, what's going on? He said, I want to tell you a story. I said, well, tell me. I sit down. He said, a long time ago, a cabinet maker. Now, y'all, some of you have heard this. Some of you are new and you hadn't. A cabinet maker came to my house and said, Mr. Raymond said, I want to sell you some cabinets. He laughed him out of the house. And he said, who's ever heard of cabinets? Nobody has cabinets. We have a pantry. Amen. And y'all remember, some of you remember those days. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. You got to, we have a pantry. We don't need any cabinets. Well, these cabinets would make it a lot easier for your wife in the kitchen. She could put her dishes and food in it. And he laughed and he said, well, Mr. Cabinet Salesman, you go ahead and go on. He said, you, you'll never sell any cabinets here. Well, the cabinet maker came back in a month. So Mr. Raymond said, said, I'm the cabinet maker. I'm here to sell you some cabinets for your lovely wife. Same story. Raymond laughed said, we have a pantry. We don't need any cabinets. What do you mean cabinets? What's this world coming to? We have a pantry. Come back the next month, the next month, and the next month. Well, Mr. Raymond looked at his wife and said, honey, I believe we beat that old cabinet salesman. He said, but I'd already made up my mind. If he come back again, I was going to buy cabinets. It had been about three months. And guess who knocked at the door? Cabinet man. Mr. Raymond said, put him in. And tears just streaming down his face after that. He said, preacher, my brother's next door. Will you keep going back? Don't quit. Keep going back. Because one day he's going to accept Christ. Do you know what I did? I made him a promise I'd go back. I went back every week. The whole time I was pastoring that church, I went back every week and I knocked at Mr. Raymond's brother's door and I told him the same thing, how that Jesus, what I've told you here today, how much Jesus loves you and what he did for you on Calvary. And I said, please, sir, will you accept Christ? He never did accept Christ. I left the church. I left the church and I went, and I took another pastorate. I got a phone call. You know what Mr. Raymond told me? He said, my brother had accepted Christ. Amen? My brother, has, he said, don't ever quit. Don't ever quit. You know what I'm looking at right here in John chapter number four? An attitude of our Lord and Savior. He never quit. And he's not going to give up on, don't you give up on him. Thank God for the attitude of compassion, of caring, of, of confidence, of commitment, of looking at you what you could be rather than what you are. The Lord Jesus is here today waiting on you to come. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Why don't you, you, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, Christ says. For I am meek and lowly in spirit, and you'll find rest. Will you come to Christ as you are? That's the way he wants you, as you are. Amen. Let's stand to our feet, please.